I asked uh, Ajay to come really late in the process, and so I'm very grateful that Ajay Skaria has agreed to come and give the keynote and be with us all day long. Um, but it's been a long and fascinating day full of good conversations. Um, I first met Ajay in 2003, I think, or so, in Mexico City. Do you yes. remember this? Yes, of course. And um, at that time, um, even though I'm older to him and I thought he was this senior figure, um, I uh, kind of listened in on conversations that Ajay was having with Uday Singh Mehta and other bigger names than me at this uh, small conference. And what, what was clear was that Ajay was engaged at that time in a very deep reading of Gandhi's corpus. And I remember you saying uh, over a dinner conversation that you have to read the Gujarati. You have to read the Gujarati. So Gandhi wrote in a few different languages, but the bulk of his corpus, I suppose, is in Gujarati. Um, and that, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, for a Marxist, um, Cambridge-educated ed historian, um, picking up Gandhi wasn't a priority uh, until, <laughs> until perhaps uh, the beginning of the new um, uh, millennium. Um, Ajay was a journalist, I believe first, then he went on to do a PhD in history at Cambridge. Um, and his first book was called Hybrid Histories, Forests, Frontiers, and Wilderness in Western India. It's a fascinating book. It's built largely on oral history um, and field work that he did in the hills of Western uh, Gujarat, I guess, um, um, with the Bhil tribe, with an Adivasi group. And he provides an alternative reading map in the introduction to that book, which I've never seen an author do. He says you can read for, uh, you can either read chapters one and two and then go to five and seven and then come back and read four uh, or, and eight, or another kind of picture emerges if you read it in a different sequence, right? So he's a very recursive thinker. It's a f it was a fascinating uh, compositional strategy for a book and that really, turned me on as a young graduate student reading that work. Um, he's long been associated with the Subaltern Studies Group. Um, in fact, he was the editor with Shail Mariam and MSS Pandian of the Subaltern Studies Volume 12, the Collected Subaltern Studies uh, book. And he's just recently published an important new work on Gandhi, which is, I suspect, a manifestation of all those late nights um, surrounded in his library with both the English and the Gujarati Gandhi as his companion. Um, I think he finds a kind, though this is not a word you use much, a kind of aporia between what Gandhi seems to be saying um, in English versus what he seems to be saying in Gujarati. And that's one of the magnetic pulls, I think, of this project for Ajay. And there's a second aporia, and it has to do with the relationship between Gandhi's vision of a, of a non-sovereign politics and um, liberalism, and liberalism's way of uh, conceptualizing sovereignty. Um, the, uh, the working out of that is fascinating, and I think that's where we're gonna be today in this conversation, is between these two aporias, which um, emerged most fully thinking about what Gandhi meant by religion, a word that Gandhi himself uses a lot to describe his conceptualizations. So we have, uh, I'm gonna now give up my duties of timekeeping and um, getting everybody mad at me for getting behind, and we'll let you speak as you like, and we'll have a question and answer afterwards. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Thank you for the very, very generous introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here. I mean, uh, I must confess I took advantage of the invitation to arrive two days early and hang out with friends because I have quite a few dear friends here. So it was, it's, I mean, the pleasure is all mine. And the talks today were fantastic. It was uh, lovely listening to you, the younger scholars and the kind of work you're doing. Uh, so 
Thank you. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just begin by prefacing what I'm going to say by saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I am today the emphasis amongst the words that I'd like to emphasize in the title is with, right? That is to say, I'm not necessarily, you know, trying to elicit what Gandhi thought, right? I am thinking with Gandhi, right? which is to say it's a relationship of, of being beside the thinker rather than, you know, which is also a way of following. Uh, and that's the, so in some ways, uh, I'm also presuming in a way, I'm, I'm trying to de develop the arguments in the book a little further, you know, take them into a more explicit conversation with other thinkers. Because one of the things, one of the limitations I tried to set myself in my book was that I would stay as close to Gandhi as possible, right? But now that I'm done with the book, I don't feel that restriction <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so let me just start. It is by now well known that Gandhi describes Satyagra, the, wor the word that is sometimes translated as passive resistance, as nothing but should dharma or true religion, quote, and quote unquote true religion. For him, they alone can offer Satyagra who have quote unquote true faith in religion. Uh, I, I quote again, the name of Rama on the lips and a dagger under the arms, that is no faith. It is no religion to speak in its name and then to do exactly the opposite of what it teaches. But anyone who has true religion and faith in him can offer Satyagra. Now, the interesting thing is that Gandhi's claim is not about the relationship between Satyagra and this or that religion. Uh, it's rather the claim is Satyagra is quote unquote true religion, religion in its concept, so to speak. Religion, the religion that stays in all religions, to use another phrase that he often uses. The neologism, Satyagra, is necessary perhaps precisely to seize the term religion from its more ossified and familiar usages. Here I'd like to continue the exploration of Satyagra that I began in my book, Unconditional Equality, by further eliciting the very striking argument being made here, that the religion that Gandhi affirms is Swaraj or freedom. Right? And not just any Swaraj of freedom, it is a Swaraj that claims to be more democratic, democratic here in the sense of being attentive to the question of the minor and minority, hmm? more democratic than the Swaraj involved in parliamentary democracy. Now, within a liberal secularist vocabulary, this argument is perplexing, uh, even perhaps illegible. Secularist traditions usually work with the concept of religious freedom. But religious freedom names are secular and individual right to not always be secular. It is a private right amongst what one might call the rights of man, uh, if you use the classic framework, or civil rights. To claim a social and immanent freedom organized around religion. Now, this is a different conceptual challenge, right? One where religion jostles up against the traditions of autonomous freedom summed up in the phrase rights of citizen or political right. One where religion can no longer be confined to the domain of civil rights, as liberal secular traditions would prefer. We can get a preliminary sense, to give a, give a sense of the challenge, let me uh, uh, go to Derrida's pre-definition of religion. And I quote, however little may be known of religion in the singular, we do know that it is always a response that is prescribed, a response that is prescribed, not chosen in freely in an act of pure and abstractly autonomous will. There is no doubt that it implies freedom, will, and responsibility. But let us try and think this, will and freedom without autonomy. Whether it is a question of sacredness, sacrificiality, or faith, the other makes the law. The law is other, to give ourselves back and up to the other. I just want to focus on this phrase for now. Let us try and think this, will and freedom without autonomy. Right? You know, as I'm sure you know, uh, in Kant's writing, autonomy is a particular figuring refiguring of sovereignty. It is one where the freedom involved in sovereignty becomes systematically generalized and shared through society. The mark of an autonomous society, and in Kant's understanding, autonomous individuals are impossible, uh, is the mark of an autonomous society is precisely that uh, here a society freely gives itself its own law. In the process, one becomes part of a community where nobody is only a means to an end, where everybody is also an end in themselves. One becomes part of a kingdom of ends. Right? Now, 
like many radical thinkers since at least the mid 19th century, Gandhi sharply questions any social order organized around autonomy. But his questions are very different from those famously articulated by, say, Marx or Nietzsche. The latter two point to the impossibility of autonomy, to how, if you take Marx, for example, to how autonomy is already always rendered spectral by the way civil society overcomes political society. Or if you take Nietzsche, how autonomy is constituted by a will to power that it is not even aware of. Okay. Uh, Gandhi takes a somewhat different tack. From Gandhi's writings, we might, infer that the, uh, we might infer the violence that would constitute autonomy, even if its formal structure were at work. Autonomy, even as a formal order, presumes what Gandhi calls an equality of sword, or what we might call an equality based on domination. This is so in two ways, and I'll just quickly rehearse this, uh, because I've already discussed this at length in the book. First, this order grants equality only to those beings presume to possess the power to reason and to measure. By doing so, it systematizes domination over all other beings. Now, therefore, to begin with, equality can only be amongst humans. And then, because the line between the human and the animal always necessarily passes through the human, right? uh, there are always those humans who are not presumed to be quite human, such as women, slaves, colonized, the terrorists, you know, the list is endless, constantly shifting, but we know the list all too well. Yeah? Anti-nationals today, right, immigrants. <laughs> uh, second, uh, autonomous beings inflict a mass, so this is an external violence, if you want to think of it. Second, there is the internal violence of autonomy from, for Gandhi, which is that the autonomous beings inflict a massive violence on themselves, for they lose the power to love, which is in, which in Gandhi's writings requires a surrender of autonomy and even sovereignty. It is because of this loss that in Gandhi's writings, uh, the English deserve, quote unquote, pity. So in both these ways, you know, even though autonomy, you know, pluralizes and equalizes sovereignty within a society, so that is what autonomy does do, it remains a rule of the major, right? Even an equality of the major, right? Here, freedom and equality is possible only through a domination over the minor. What is lost is the possibility of an exit from subalternity that does not participate in domination or majority. So it's against autonomy that Gandhi affirms religion. But he does so in a way that diverges from the way we usually understand religion. In Derrida's pre-definition, for example, even if religion is freedom without autonomy, it is still associated with and born by a will. It even brings into being a will, right? So by, you know, so, so to recall what, what Derrida says, just to remind you, since, uh, you know, it's sometimes I've mentioned the phrase, Derrida talks of uh, religion as a will and freedom without autonomy, right? So there is still a will here, if you notice. By contrast, Gandhi's writings suggest to think of religion as a will and freedom without autonomy is still to think religion from within a liberal secularist framework. Gandhi offers a different way to think religion, or Gandhi's, to be precise, Gandhi's writing offers a different way to think religion. When I say Gandhi, I don't mean Gandhi the author, I mean Gandhi as somebody whom one, one is thinking with, just to be clear. Uh, Gandhi offers a different way to think religion through a contrast between willing or sovereign freedom and non-willing or non-sovereign freedom, uh, or religion as a secular freedom enacted in the very act of surrendering without subordination to others. Moreover, the religion that is articulated in willing or sovereign freedom obscures religion as a non-willing or non-sovereign freedom. Where the difference between the two is not uh, encountered, there the phenomenon of religion remains in fundamental obscurity where the difference between willing freedom and non-willing freedom is not obscured. Symptomatically, perhaps, despite the enormous brilliance of Derrida's essay, in many ways it falls away from its own crucial insights. You know, and where we do think the difference, we can thematize a difference uh, that remains obscure in Derrida's pre-definition, that between two religions, both modern and secular, but one theological and the other mystical. 
So that's the broad framework of the argument I want to make about this non-sovereign religion. And here I'd like to pursue this argument by offering a series of, well, ideally eight remarks, but I shall play it by the ear and maybe limit it to six or seven depending on the time, right? Uh, so let me begin with uh, remark one, which is that you know, Gandhi conceptualizes sovereignty not as concentrated in the state, but as ubiquitous and plural. Right. Uh, so let me make a series of points about each of these point, remarks. Okay. So A, one of Gandhi's synonyms for Satyagraha is abhedan, the gift of fearlessness. This description of, uh, of nonviolence as abhedan is not new. He's only reiterating Jain texts, which describe abhedan uh, as the first and only gift. In order to arrive at why abhay is abhay, that is to say fearlessness, is so crucial, we must start with its opposite, bhay or fear. Hmm? Involved in bhaya is the encounter with domination or subordination. Abhay is, very simply put, the experience of freedom from bhay. One way of experiencing such freedom is by mastering bhay. Uh, so sovereign, one, more, one may say, in Gandhi's formulation, very much this is what comes across, that sovereign is he who masters bhay. Right? Uh, this mastery is, for Gandhi, the mark of the ranveer or veer, you know, the, 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 the warrior. And as you know, of course, the word veer shares an etymology with the word virtue, but we'll not go into that here. Uh, the Ranveer has mastered fear in the sense that uh, he is by definition the figure who is fearless in the face of his own death. As this emphasis on the veer, veer and warrior should make clear, sovereignty is impossible without the prospect of war, beginning with the war that makes the self one. So point B. But the mastery of bhai in Gandhi's writing, even if exemplified by the warrior, is available to all being. Rather than sovereignty as, or Raj as political monopoly, you know, we encounter here the irrepressible plurality of sovereignty, the sense in which there is never only one sovereign. See, because this is one very interesting phenomenon. When, when you define bhai, sovereignty in terms of a relationship with bhai, it becomes plural in a way that it is not earlier. Sovereignty is at work not only at the apex of the state, not only in the everyday, me not only in the everyday mecha mechanisms of the state, but in everyday relations of domination and subordination. One proliferation of this is a symptom. Is a prolifer is one symptom of this is the proliferation of raj and raj as suffixes, prefixes as descriptors for animals, humans, and things. C. This sovereignty is for Gandhi the necessary prelude to Satyagraha which is why he insists repeatedly that even those who do not have courage or commitment to be satyagrahis must at least be veer or warriors, which is to say sovereign. You know, and he says, for example, look, if you, can't, if you don't have the courage to, to practice satyagraha, then have the courage to kill, right? which, which may seem paradoxical if you think of satyagraha as nonviolence in the normal sense. Right? So, but don't at least have the courage to resist. You know? So that's a very fascinating description in some ways. Uh, then, as, and those who practice satyagraha, he suggests, must relinquish sovereignty and experience another kind of abhay or fearlessness. D, why should this be so? Because sovereigns master fear in a, in a distinctive way by redistributing it amongst others. First, relations between sovereigns are governed by the friend-enemy distinction, but even friendship here is not constituted by pleasure in the singularity of the other. Right? The friend can only be understood negatively in terms that accord primacy to the enemy. Enemies are here those to whom the sovereign gives fear, and friends are those from whom the sovereign withholds fear. Second, in their relationship with, with, in their relationship with those whom they are sovereign over, sovereigns can give fearlessness only by giving fear. And, and, and this even in situations such as Ram Rajya, for even here, subjects remain subordinate to the sovereign's decision. Sovereign is thus never abhedan. Sovereignty is thus never abhedan or the gift of fearlessness. It is only the mastery by sovereigns of their own fear. It is only the redistribution of fear. Okay. So in this order, where sovereignty is the mastery of fear by redistributing fear to others, Hind Swaraj comes up with the formulation 
that Satyagraha is Abhedan, the gift of fearlessness. So the question then is, but where would Abhedan leave sovereignty? And that is what I want to turn to for the rest of this essay. Rest of this talk, sorry. Uh, uh, remark two, uh, the increasing prominence from the 18th century of the word Swaraj is one symptom of a global reworking of the concept of sovereignty or the concept of Raj, a reworking where sovereignty becomes conjoined to freedom. Now, point A. Uh, one of the things that makes Gandhi's Hind Swaraj and Gandhi's writing more broadly an unavoidable horizon in any history of modern political thought is the way it articulates a relationship between sovereignty and freedom. On the one hand, you know, as I'm sure all of you here have read Hind Swaraj, so as you know, there's the figure of the reader in it and the figure of the editor in it. So on the one hand, the figure of the reader articulates the vision where sovereignty and freedom are yoked together. This yoking is what the reader calls Swaraj. On the other hand, the figure of the editor articulates a vision where sovereignty are and freedom are unyoked from each other. This unyoking, the editor names Swaraj. Right. So you have really almost exactly two opposite visions of Swaraj confronting each other. One where sovereignty and freedom are yoked together, and the other where they are not. Swaraj thus emerges in Hind Swaraj and Gandhi's writings more broadly as a term in which the conjoining of sovereignty and freedom, freedom occurs in two ways, as yoking and as unyoking. Symptomatic of this charge carried by the term Swaraj is its curious untranslatability. You know, I mean, I think as those of you who've read Hind Swaraj you know, in later chapters, the word Swaraj is not translated very much. In the title of the book itself, the title remains Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule. And an etym etymological step back to the prefix Swa may remind us of, this, of the work done by this word Swaraj. The question of the Swa, which could be glanced, which would be glossed over as self, own, or even own Musa proper, is an originary one as is indicated by its ubiquity in some of the oldest layers of Sanskrit texts. When I say originary, one should not conf conf confuse this word with either the original origin or the general. The origin provides a beginning by grounding. The general stabilizes by revealing the highest principles of at work in the particular. By contrast, the originary is, and I would put is within quotes here, the originary is the opening instability in which all being is held. As such, it destabilizes and gives newness to every present. This is the sense in which it is futural, or the future given in the beginning. The swa, quote unquote, is originary in the same in the sense that it names the division of the I into the more than one, because you can have a concept of the self only where you don't have a unified I. Right? The moment the I recognizes a self that exceeds it, that stays apart from it, and that destabilizes it. With this division, it becomes both possible to ask and respond to the question, what is proper to being? Right. So only where there is this originary division named by this word swa, by the word self, does, is that possible? This question is, of course, also the question of responsibility, for it is a question of how to bear this propriety of being. Point C. Philosophy, as Nietzsche remarks, is a type of atavism of the highest order. If Gandhi is so seized by the word Swaraj as to find it untranslatable, perhaps this has to do with the way, this has to do with its atavism, with the way it articulates for his historical moment the opening instability of Swaraj. Uh, D. Uh, Swaraj is riven and destabilized by two modern atavisms. First, what is distinctive about Swaraj is that the Swa is never individual. Swaraj always involves a sh imminent and shared plurality. Thus, Swaraj is not continuous with the tradition of moksha or individual liberation from the cycle of death, of life and death. Nor is it liberty as liberation from huh, or negative freedom, which can be easily thought of as primarily individual or as the extension to society of an individual experience. Nor even is it quite freedom to or the positive freedom that is the focus of the capabilities approach and that again can be exercised by both individuals and societies. Rather, Swaraj is marked by the specter of being with others. Right? That's the sense, distinction between Swaraj and between, you know, this is the sense in which Swaraj is freedom rather than liberation. Hmm? Uh, not even another, 
but others. Swaraj begins with three. Where there is Swaraj, in other words, there arises the question of the sovereignty of the many together. This is a constitutively different phenomenon from the sovereignty of simple Raj. Even if that former, so former sovereignty was plural, it did not have to engage in the same way with the question of being together. Because of this immanent and shared plurality it shares, Swaraj can well be translated as freedom. At least if we bear in mind that on some readings, for example, a rent, as Lisa and I were reminded, we were talking about just yesterday. Uh, uh, for example, rent freedom, as distinct from liberation, is imbued with the same sense of plurality. For Swaraj and freedom in this sense, the most appropriate preposition is with, right? Swaraj with, right? Rather than Swaraj from, effectively. Uh, I will pass over the one more point that I was making about the atavistic equality that involves that is involved in Swaraj. And let me move to the third point I want, want to make. Uh, actually, let me just quickly stress that what is also involved in Swaraj would be at least a notion of equality, right? Because to be with is also to be equal to. And we can get back to this at, at length if you want to later. Uh, so with Swaraj, the question then arises, how can equals be one and many simultaneously? Or in other words, how to be together as equals? And hence Swaraj is so compelling because it diverges from the conventional thinking of the political, which where to be get together as equals requires a sovereign freedom. Instead, it suggests that sovereign freedom can never sustain a being together as equal, that being together as equals requires rather a non-sovereign freedom. Uh, remark three, you know, uh, this epochal combine, conjoining of sovereignty and freedom, and I say call it epochal because as I was suggesting in the morning, you know, it's something that happens really, that begins happening around the 17th century, maybe slightly earlier. You know, epochal conjoining of sovereignty and freedom is born by an old entity that is now reconstituted, the loke or people. In this reconstitution, the people becomes for liberal secularism the bearers of a willing freedom that must be reworked as autonomy. And I just want to begin by reading out, just to remind you, because especially when you read it in, in translation, you don't notice these things as much. Huh? Uh, one, the first answer to the first question that the editor, that the reader asked the editor. So in the first exchange, in the first chapter of Hinswaraj, the reader remarks that our countrymen, Saha Hindi, appear to be pining for national independence and asked the editor, Will you explain your views in this matter? And the editor replies, you have put the question well, but the answer is not easy. One of the objects of a newspaper is to understand popular, lokoni feeling, and to give expression to it. Another is to arouse amongst the people, lokoma, uh, certain desirable sentiments. And the third is to fearlessly expose popular, lokoni uh, defects. The exercise of all these three functions is involved in answering your question. To a certain extent, the people's will, lok lagani, has to be expressed. Certain sentiments will need to be fostered, and the defects will have to be brought to light. Right? But since you've asked the question, it is my duty to answer it. All I want to stress, and the reason I read out this, is just to remind you how pervasive the lok is, right? which is something we often miss when we read Hindu Swaraj. Right? That there, so what, and this happens throughout, you know, that the, the word lok is there everywhere. And, you know, and this figure is ubiquitous not only in Hind Swaraj, but from in other writings, at least from the 18th century. And uh, I will not go here since all of you are history, since all of you kind of know the literature, I will not go into the literature. And I just want to stress that, you know, what is happening here is that the reader and the editor both fervently affirm a people place, right? It is a people, a lok, but it is also a place, Hind. And there is no people that is not also always a place. Uh, but they configure the people place very differently. And in this configuration, we discern the articulation also of the oppositional relationship between a sovereign politics and a non-sovereign politics, between a willing freedom and a non-willing freedom. Uh, let me begin for in this section, in this remark, only by noting uh, three elements that mark the reader's understanding. First, as you saw, there is people's will, uh, Gandhi's translation of Lok Lagni. 
the full locus of a willing freedom. I say willing freedom to distinguish the distinctive texture of modern freedom, a texture organized around the will, which I take following Kant to be the power of, quote unquote, spontaneously beginning a series of successive things or states. I say willing freedom, now emphasizing the word freedom, also in order to stress that this freedom is not about the individual free will, but about the question of how individual free wills are to freely will together. Right? Willing freedom is conceived in terms of intentional power over others, beginning with the other that one oneself is. Because don't forget, as I said, that you know, with the self you have the division of the I. Right? Uh, this intentional power over oneself is one, is, is one sense in which the will potentially diverges from desire, the name given to the unintentional power that threatens the, the will. Freedom thought in terms of the will thus involves assuming responsibility through the exercise of an everyday sovereignty over both self and, and surroundings. So that's the first point. The second point I want to make, uh, you know, is again for sticking on to the editor's reader's vision, is that this is that the reader's vision for remaking this willing freedom is indicated briefly in Hind Swaraj when he remarks that when India gets Swaraj, it should follow Spencer and Mill and import British institutions such as the passage implies, such as the British institutions, such as the British Parliament. What the reader envisions then is a reorganizing of willing freedom along the lines that privilege, and the reader's remarks are too brief here to be more def definitive, along lines that privilege some liberal order of civil and political rights. Yeah? What will be distinctive about the reader's vision, even on this schematic account, is that liberalism institutionalizes willing freedom of the people in a way that acknowledges that the internal divisions and plurality involved in freedom make the content, though not the form, of sovereignty un unknowable. I want to stress, make the content but not the form of sovereignty and noble. That this is, after all, the structure of democracy, right? That the form is given, but the content is not given, right? Sovereignty is here marked by, if you wish, an autoimmunity of content, though never an autoimmunity of form. Third, and this I will be again brief about so that we, we can get to later points too. Uh, there is the acknowledgement that there is never only one people. There are peoples. In fact, that is very central to the whole notion of people as it emerges here. In Hind Swaraj, we see peoples in two different senses. Uh, on the one hand, there are the English as a people, a people with another place. Hmm? Then, on the other hand, there are the thugs, bheels, and pinda pindaris, you know, who are also peoples of the same place. Hmm? We thus have uh, two others, so to speak. One is the other from, uh, from elsewhere, and the other is the other who is in some senses in the same place. And you know, the reader affirms how both the British and the Bheel must be dealt with in a manner that affirms the sovereignty of the Indian people, right, obviously. So there is this notion of the Indian people that the reader is producing in this very process, how the British must not be a lot of footing in India, and how at the same time Pax Britannica should be the model for how the Indian state after Swaraj will treat Bheels, Pindaris, and Thugs. Right? So in other words, I want to stress that this exclusion and domination of other peoples, hmm, this illiberalism towards other peoples, so to speak, is constitutive of the leader's, reader's liberalism rather than something that comes afterwards. Right? There, is no there is no liberalism without also this creation of a people that it excludes and that it dominates. OK, so that's remark three. Let me turn to remark four, and after this, I'll turn to Gandhi's uh, remarks a bit more. Uh, the liberal division of the people is accompanied by the modern concept of religion. It is too preliminary to understand this concept of religion as opposing the secular to the sacred. And it is even more preliminary to see it as, uh, to understand it in terms of the transcendent immanent opposition. Rather, the modern concept of religion names principally the willing freedoms that remain in heterogeneous time. Okay, so this is in some senses, I mean, where I'm trying to basically move away from the way we think religion to understand better the place of religion in, liberal, in the liberal uh, play, order. Hmm? Point A, 
As Talal Assad has famously argued, religion is a modern concept that emerges simultaneously with the Siamese in secularism. And it is as such a general concept that it makes visible the affinity of various religions. I would add two remarks to Assad's argument. The first is about the contours of the transcendent immanent distinction. This distinction as a way of thinking about a general concept of religion is intimated already in Locke's letter concerning toleration. Here, one argument that Locke offers for toleration is that the business of true religion is that it's concerned with the regulating of men's lives according to virtue and piety. Such rules, Locke averse, are not to be made by, by civil authorities, but are rather inward. Uh, or Locke offers, in other words, a double individualism. You know, because if you remember the the, the second uh, the, the treatise concerning government, on the one hand, uh, this, this, the second treatise, in the second treatise, he's laying out the idea, the individualism of the man who owns himself, right? And on this basis, interacts with society, and and this man who interacts with society, his he's part of the business of civil government. Here you have, on the other hand, another man. Huh? A man who withdraws from society and withdraws and, and communes with himself. Religion is transcendent not here, not in the sense that it is concerned with another sphere, right, which is often the way we understand the word transcendent, but rather in the sense that uh, individuals withdraw from the sociality involved in civil government, and in that very sociality, inhabit other social institutions, such as the church. Hmm? The distinction between the transcendent and the immanent, thus, is organized by an implicit distinction between liberation and freedom. Right? Religion thus becomes the domain of the pursuit of an individualized liberation, and, civ uh, and civil government becomes the domain for the pursuit of an individualized freedom. Okay. Uh, if there were the time, I would show, I, I think one could argue that you know, the, 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 the Kantian concept of a rational or reflecting faith is very similar, and it does something very, very similar, but I'll just skip over that for now, and move to what one might call a second concept of religion. Yeah. And the second concept of religion, again, second liberal concept of religion, uh, is constituted perhaps by this phrase that Kant uses you know, when he talks, when he, what he opposes to reflecting faith. Reflecting faith is the faith that we have as rational beings right, who really realize that, look, the good religion is always a religion that realizes that we should withdraw and leave civil government to, uh, to the other part of ourselves, which is more rational. Mm -hmm. But along with that, he talks also of dogmatic faith. You know, and for Kant, dogmatic faith is clearly unfreedom. There is no willing, willing freedom here. And yet, even in Kant, the relationship to dogmatic faith cannot be simply oppositional. There's a very fascinating passage in uh, the appendix to Towards Perpetual Peace, you know, where he says, where he's asking, look, how do you deal with a race of devils, uh, each of whom is secretly inclined to exempt himself from the universal laws needed to preserve the race? And as Kant requires, as Kant notes, well, the way to deal with it is, does not require that we know how to attain the moral improvement of men, but only that we should know the mechanism of nature in order to use it on men. Organizing the conflict of the hostile intentions present in people in such a way that they must compel themselves to submit to coercive laws. So, you know, remember what's happening here. Kant's invocation of devils reminds us to begin with that what is outside religion is always infected by the specter of dogmatic religion. And since this dogmatic religion cannot be extirpated, Kant is saying, look, let's face it, we, we're not going to get rid of it. There are other race of devils with us all the time. Uh, it's essential to manage the race of devils, right? And the, the race of devils is us, I mean, as far as Kant is concerned, right? <laughs> yeah. So there is no autonomy, in other words. Huh? Uh, so if you're to maintain autonomy, you have to manage the race of autonomy, right? So there is no autonomy, in other words, which does not have to constantly manage non-autonomy, our own non-autonomy. Uh, even perhaps rise from the management of non-autonomy, rise from the management of faith, right? And so, Effectively, what I'm trying to argue is that, look, dogmatic faith is always part of this, this problem, right? The problem that Kant is facing. And already in Kant's life, moreover, what he calls dogmatic faith is increasingly being recast as willing freedom rather than simple unfreedom. Perhaps the most crucial 
a shift is the consolidation of a distinctive quote unquote mechanism of nature, if one is to use Kant's phrase, the distinction between rights of citizen and rights of man. Right. Uh, you know, if one may, while the rights of citizen conceptualize a political emancipation, to use Marx's phrase, a political emancipation that is congruent with Kantian aut autonomy and its empty homogeneous face, the rights of man are a different matter and refigure the rights of citizen. The rights of man articulate a will and freedom without autonomy, right? And what I'm calling rights of man are what you'd also call civil rights, what you'd also call the private sphere, right? the public and the private, just to make it clear what I'm talking about. Uh, the rights of man articulate a will and freedom without autonomy. It is precisely because willing freedom is here no longer governed by autonomy that the rights of man must belong to the private sphere, must enact a secularity without secularism. It seems to me that there are two modalities to the rights of man. First, again, man, and I think one of the problems with the way we've been thinking political theory, pol political theory as conceptualized as matters, that we have not yet paid attention to the, to the fact that there are two modalities involved here. First, man is a figure who has property in his own person. And second, man is a figure who is driven by inward persuasion or quote unquote religion. Hmm? Man's property in his own person, we know very well. It takes the form of labor, a property capable of being abstracted so as to take the social forms of commodity and capital. Both commodity and capital, and especially the latter, traverse and constitute the same homogeneous time as autonomy. But they do so in a manner that undoes the autonomous subject. This is, for example, what is constantly recognized in the distinction we make between instrumental reason and substantive reason. So beginning with at least the young marks of the Jewish, of on the Jewish question, it has often been assumed that what is distinctive about religion as a modern concept is that it is now cast as a man exercising his property in his own person. But I would suggest that religion here names rather a second modality of the rights of man, a modality that supplements man's ownership of himself. Um, this is the modality of man's inward persuasion, to recall uh, Locke's phrase. But such inward persuasion is unknowable to others. The space for inward persuasion can thus only be sustained also by allowing the space for dogmatic faith. Put differently, when inward persuasion is recognized as a form of the rights of man, this requires the suspension of the distinction between will and desire. This inward pers persuasion constitutes a heterogeneous time, a time simultaneously resistant to both autonomous and instrumental reason, and yet infecting both, producing, amongst other things, that phenomenon that Marx calls commodity fetishism. Right. So it's not as though, you know, Marx is very clearly aware that this, it's not as though heterogeneous time can be kept out. Uh, and you know, one of the interesting things about Durkheim, I will go, I wish I had more time to dwell on this because one of the interesting things about Durkheim is that perhaps it is Durkheim who more than anybody else systematizes this distinction, uh, especially in the definition that he offers in, by the early 20th century. And as he puts it, a religion is a unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred things, that is to say things set apart and forbidden beliefs and practices which unite into a single moral community called the church, all those who adhere to them. Uh, and then he goes on to argue that religion must be eminently a collective thing. Okay. Now, note what, what is happening here. This is a very, now, you know, earlier we talked of dogmatic freedom. Now we are coming to a situation where the sacred is conceptualized as a social domain, right? Uh, whose distinctness can be explained in terms of secular regularities and peculiarities. Yeah. And as a considerable body of scholarship has, has, has shown, this new concept of religion is enormously productive. Not only does it enable the modern formations that we call uh, Hinduism, Islam, or Christianity, it also enables the fundamentalism such as Hindutva or Zionism, uh, which even as they refuse to accept the secularist privileging of autonomy, remain thoroughly secular in the sense that they articulate themselves as a, as a willing freedom. Okay, so given all of this, I would add just two caveats to Talal Asa's powerful and persuasive argument that there can be no universe, that there cannot be a universal definition of religion. First, that even though there cannot be a universal definition of religion, there can be an index of how these historic and specifically shifting definitions are made. The index is this, that religion names the shifting contents of the willing freedom which is articulated in heterogeneous time, with the shifting contents that liberal secularism gets as 
opposed to both autonomy and to the homogeneous time of capital. Yeah. Relatedly, it would be somewhat misplaced to describe what, here, what happens here as the invention of the concept of religion. Uh, rather, we should say that when it has become widespread to articulate freedom in terms of the wills, of wills giving themselves their own law, the concept of religion emerges. Second, and this is a more important point, it would be f misleading to focus religion in this sense, uh, focus on religion only in this sense, or religion only in the sense of willing freedom articulated in heterogeneous time. Religion in this sense is only the concept that complements secularism. There is also a religion that supplements secularism. Right? So what I'm stressing so far is that, look, we've been when we have this fantastic critique that I don't want to reject at all of the Talal Asad and others are offered, it is what they identify is religion as a phenomenon that complements secularism. Right? Instead, what, I, what Gandhi is focusing on is religion in the sense that supplements secularism. Okay. And as long as we focus only on the secularist social object called religion, we miss out on what may be most crucial about religion, this act of supplementation of secularism. Uh, you know, in saying this, I'm only mimicking uh, Terda's rem uh, remark about Moss's book on the gift, that the book is about everything but the gift, right? Uh, put differently, while the critique that Al-Sad launches is necessary to question the relationships of power that produce religion as a, as a secularist concept, it tells us nothing about religion as a non-willing freedom. That is to say, a freedom that is both that is secular and social, but not, uh, but not willing. Okay, uh, this is only remark five, but I think I shall, at the risk of uh, you know, not being able to go through much of it, I'll at most make it through remark six, so that I can stop by 5.30. Sounds reasonable? Yeah. Um, so you know, around the same time that Durkheim articulates his concept of religion, Gandhi identifies religion with the experience of the pavitra or the puja, uh, a word that he translates as sacred or holy. Uh, and here, uh, relatedly, you know, and on the other hand, with the sacrifice that the sacred requires. Uh, here, the sacred is that with what, which one experiences a surrender of sovereignty that is before the will or non-willing. Okay, so, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things that Gandhi does is he insists on the ubiquity of religion. He insists, for example, that, look, uh, there is nobody who is not religious. And the question is, what, what is the sense in which he means this? And the argument that I make in this uh, remark is really about how he can make this because he's insistent that even the atheists hold, there's a certain sense in which they make their atheism sacred, right? that they make it incalculable. So the sacred becomes whatever is incalculable to one. Right? And of course, uh, you know, the other thing that uh, that is, is crucial to Gandhi's notion of the sacred is that the sacred always requires sacrifice. Hmm? Uh, as, uh, you know, as, as he himself says, that let us not forget that, uh, you know, that, that there can be no sacred without sacrifice. Hmm? Okay. And at the same time, he's very clear that, that this religion, even though it's there everywhere, it is originary and originarily obscured. I say originary in the sense that it intimates uh, non-willing freedom. Uh, I say originally obscured because even though sacred and sacrifice can be embodied in multiple ways, most of these fall away from the seizure of non-willing freedom. Right? Most of them become religion in the, in the, in the sense that the secularism understands religion. Right? So in some senses, Gandhi's argument is that, look, there is religion. Uh, there is this obscured religion, origin originary and originally obscured religion that is very much there in in, in the concept of religion as it's used. Uh, remark six. Uh, Satyagraha is the religion that stays in all religions because it involves a discipline of fidelity or faithfulness to non-willing freedom, to the experience of non-sovereignty. This fidelity, Gandhi articulates in terms of abhedan, the gift of fear fearlessness. And abhedan brings forth, amongst other things, a different concept of the lok or people. Okay. What makes Satyagraha a religion that stays in all religion is the way it conceives its subject, sacrifice. Here, sacrifice is not simply self-sacrifice. Rather, self-sacrifice names a distinctive sociality, that which Gandhi describes as Abhedan. Abhedan requires the Satyagraha to cultivate a discipline that offers their own surrender and vulnerability to others. 
And of course, there's a discipline. That is to say, it's not just that one can be of a vulnerability without, you know. So this is, in some senses, uh, what he's focusing on a lot in the ashram wars, right? And this is what most of his writing is about. The experience of non-sovereignty transforms the very concepts that he shares with mainstream na nationalists such as readers. Consider the editor's description of his Swaraj in chapter 14 of his Swaraj. When we experience rule, Rajya Bhogavir, over ourselves, only over ourselves, when we experience rule over ourselves, only that is Swaraj, and that Swaraj is in the palm of our hands. Do not consider this Swaraj to be like a dream. This is not a Swaraj that can be accepted in the mind while sitting still. This Swaraj is such that once you have tasted it, you will diligently devote your life to giving others a flavor of it. But the principal thing is that each one has to experience Swaraj for oneself. Okay. As is implied by the phrase in the palm of our hands, the editor's Swaraj is instantaneous, messianic. Right? It is tempting to venture here a contrast between two times, the homogeneous and heterogeneous times of Swaraj, exemplified respectively by the reader and the editor. But that contrast is quite simply wrong. A messianic uh, understanding of time is scarcely limited to the editor. Messianic mobilizations are a persistent feature of all, of, all, of all social movements. Indeed, messianism could be well described as a synonym for what Durkheim calls religion. Right? And as we know, the Swaraj that, uh, that uh, the descendants of the reader, such as Nehru, have is also marked by messianism. What is distinctive then about the editor's arguments is not that it affirms a heterogeneous time, but something more. The editors, Swaraj and Satyagraha, strive to be faithful to what is most proper to heterogeneous time. Okay. So that rather than heterogeneous time occurring along with homogeneous time, in some senses, the editors uh, and Gandhi's politics focuses on trying to say what is proper to heterogeneous time. Indeed, if autonomy and the rights of citizen are the attempt to specify what is most proper to the homogeneous time of capital, then the editor Sadhyagra is the attempt to be most faithful to what is proper to the messianic and heterogeneous time that undoes the logic of capital. And it is this, it is as he tries to uh, elaborate on this that he comes up with uh, you know, the emphasis on uh, Swaraj in the sense of being tasted for oneself. And the word that for, word for experience is bhugavu which again is also the bodily experience associated equally with intense pleasure and intense suffering. The seizure by the taste of Swaraj is what makes it a non-willing experience. But even if this Swaraj must begin in solitude, remember it imposes its own sociality. Seized by the taste of Swaraj, any mind-body distinction becomes possible. Now the individual will not sit still. Seized individuals will need to spend their whole life giving others too a flavor of Swaraj. Swaraj must thus seek to spread further, to become a collective and social freedom. But even in its collectivity, Swaraj remains an experience of solitude. For what is being spread is a taste for collective solitude, so to speak. Constitutive Satyagraha and its Swaraj is thus a, a oneness and a plurality. And each of these ways stays apart from the autonomous citizen. OK, let me just actually, no, I'll just. Uh, I, I, I was getting a little hopeful, and I thought maybe I should try one more, some more points, but maybe I will not. I will just uh, want to stress that what, I'll just try and give an overall sense of the argument that I'm making. Uh, the attempt in this and in the project that I'm doing right now is to place Gandhi within a global history of concepts, right? within, and in some senses to globalize one's concepts, to see, not to create an alternative Indian narrative, right? Uh, nor, but rather to look at how an inhabiting of the margin of automatically sometimes requires of its most rigorous thinkers that perhaps against their conscious will, they are forced to engage with also the concepts of the metropole, right? Which, uh, so that is perhaps what I'm teasing out at its most uh, general. And in some ways, this is, uh, that is what this essay was trying to do. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Sorry. 
Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I, I probably missed a step mm -hmm. on this. I was wondering if you could clarify it once again for me. Um, and that is the idea of the sociality of Swaraj. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because at the same time, there is this very, very strong sense of the individualness of Swaraj, right? Yes. This emphasis on self-care, yes. the emphasis that the one individual makes a difference, right? Yes. So you get this kind of bizarre statements by Gandhi that you have two satyagrahis who are real satyagrahis, and, and the you whole get world Swaraj, too. right? Yes. You get Swaraj. Yes. So I am kind of interested in the way you are thinking of that swa of Swaraj also in terms of the collective. And maybe one little part that I wanna add there is the way you reread the preface in Hind Swaraj, and I'm thinking actually of the start of the autobiography. Yes. Where the autobiography says something which actually is pretty bizarre. I mean, it says that everything I do is for moksha. You know, mm -hmm. my political work, my uh, social work, everything is for this very personal, individual desire for moksha. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder then how you pair in, in your, and I know this is not Gandhi, but his corpus that you're reading, but how you see the individual and collective, the plural and the uni uni unified or. Yes, one. yes. No, I think that's a great question. I think it really gets to the, co the, the, the core of the problem. I mean, wha some of it uh, you, al you, already, you already know, uh, as, uh, but I'll just say it for the, uh, since uh, you know, we are both working on Gandhi, but others are not, <laughs> you know, uh, that uh, you know, part of what's involved in uh, what is uh, striking about Gandhi is the way that he's so contradictory, right? And much of uh, what both you and I have been doing is tracing out the way that these contradictions work in some ways, and this is one of the ways that I've tried to argue for this, about this is by focusing on the notion of a radical conservatism, right? where Gandhi begins out with a conservatism that is fairly conventional. Right? But the weight of his own contradictions produces a, a radical conservatism in the sense, in the etymological sense of uh, uprooting. Right? And I suspect that there is something similar to this that happens with the word moksha. Right? It's not just in the autobiography. Everywhere, you know, this word moksha is there. Right? You know, it's, he's insistent that he's doing it for moksha. So I think one of the, uh, so I think to the extent that Gandhi is conceptualizing it explicitly, it is very striking that he rarely exp explicitly manages to move beyond the emphasis on moksha. Right? But at the same time, you have always this insistence that look, my moksha itself requires that I work for this other thing. So it's as though moksha collapses under the weight of its contradictions and opens, so liberation opens onto, an emphasis on liberation opens onto an emphasis on freedom. Right? So there is the sense in which uh, Gandhi is constantly undoing here, as in many other cases, his argument. And I think moksha is actually one of those striking, one of those classic examples where this happens, where this kind of undoing of his own, own argument happens. Uh, so I would say, and I think again, the Hind Swaraj passage is very, which we are talking about just earlier today, is very interesting. Where you know, where he talks of how people participate in each other, and uh, when he talks of this part, when he talks, when he, he attacks the whole notion of the people, of the, the leader's notion of the people, he says, look, the railways have created, have destroyed the people. Now, this is very interesting because if you think of the people that's constituted by the railways, it is exactly the people in the abstract and homogeneous sense. It is the people in abstract and homogeneous time. Right? And against this people, he counterposes another people, right? a people co constituted by walking, by moving in bullock carts. Right? And now this is a people that comes to be marked as, uh, as you know, by finitude. And this notion of a people that is marked by finitude does not lend itself in the same way even for even to a term such as populism, right? Because populism requires to begin with an abstract and homogeneous people. Right? Does that kind of is that is that where broadly where you're going? Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. I think your hand is up. <laughs> Thank you for that fascinating talk. And I kind of I'm trying to draw draw a line between, you know, some of us were here at Minnie's talk <laughs> um, earlier this week about um, and she was sort of looking at the historical sort of 
constitution of the people. Uh -huh. and, like, and you're talking about many peoples here when you're think, thinking with Gandhi. And I was wondering if you could, I mean, if I could just sort of, I just really just want to know more about the peoples. Because like, what you just said about the railways, I mean, it is a very non intuitive sort of sense of thinking of what the people and how, how they're constituted. And if there's like a global sort of concept of, you know, idea of the people that then you can also then trace uh, in, in Hind Swaraj. Uh, I think there is, I think in some ways what, and because it's very interesting that Gandhi, for example, works with the contrast between modern civilization and true civilization. And one of the ways that he thinks of modern civilization is actually very bizarre, right? Because he says that our ancestors were fighting against modern civilization, right? So it says the modern civilization has already existed for thousands of years, right? So it's clear that what he's calling modern civilization is not modern, even if it's become dominant at this particular time, is not modern in the sense of you know, the, the modern as, as we usually think of it. You know, and one of the things that uh, you know, I uh, actually go on to argue in the next sense, in the next actually argument, is about two, uh, three senses of religion, right? The religion occurs as part of a threefold, right? The, the non-religious, the irreligious, and you know, the religious, right? And in some ways, I think, if you were to think of the notion of people that he's trying to lay out here, what he's laying out is a notion, the religious notion of people would be a, a no, notion constituted by vulnerability, you know, and where in some senses so the question of sacrifice, the question of religion comes up in that sense, right? And that's the sense in which one can talk of people also in a more mystical sense. Mystical, where mystical is opposed to theological, right? That which grounds. Hmm? Whereas what he's calling uh, a religion is precisely the abstract notion of people, you know, what he called, when he, when, you know, which he associates with quote unquote modern civilization. Yeah. So there is a sense in which, I mean, you know, what is striking, for example, again, I mean, another example that one can give of, of to, to explain what is going on is a, the tension between Gandhi's uh, emphasis on, uh, on to, to, to go back to a point that I skipped over, is, you know, he attacks mobocracy all the time. And it's famous, you know, as you know. Uh, amongst other things, uh, Ranajit Da has written, Ranajit Guha has written uh, famously about describing this, you know, this phrase. And it's one of the things, one of the arguments I make is that it'd be too preliminary to read this word as simply creased with loathing, right? As Ranajit Da describes it, right? Mobocracy is antithetical to autonomy, but like its more neutral synonym, populism, right? Uh, it is a willing freedom, a moment when heterogeneous time bursts onto the public sphere both imbuing itself and transforming the homogeneous time of autonomy. So let's put it this way, that people in the way that the category comes to be constituted is from its beginning, the way that, you know, the, the, this is from, from its beginning marked by a certain kind of fetishism, by the coming together of the homogeneous and the heterogeneous, right? And so one might say that both the editor and the reader oppose mobocracy or oppose populism, if you want to put it in our contemporary terms. Yeah. But they do so for very different reasons. The reader would do so because he affirms the pedagogic project involved in autonomy, because autonomy is nothing if not a pedagogic project, right? which says that, look, populism is wrong, because if you separate the rights of man and rights of citizen, then you won't have populism. Right? Whereas the editor does so because he affirms satyagraha as what is proper to a heterogeneous time. So you can see that the reader and the editor both share a hostility to populism, but they do so from very, very different angles. And if you want a figure for the, if you want a proper name for the for populism as it is to develop later, I mean the first name that comes to mind right away is Savarkar, right? So, who constitutes the the Indian people? You know, so. Yeah. So a quick question. Um, so liberalism is really bad at thinking about action. Mm -hmm. It's actually really kind of left out. Yes. When, when you think about what liberal freedom is. So I'm wondering about what is the relationship of Swaraj to action? And I was thinking about this as you were talking about the idea of giving others a taste for Swaraj. When I think about that in, for example, in Arendt's writings, yes. that the centerpiece of that would be action. That is where... Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, that, is, that is exactly, I mean, to go back to our conversation yesterday, that is exactly where the question of action come, becomes so central, also to Gandhi, right? Because. Uh, Again, Gandhi cannot think his politics because what is again striking about Swaraj, and again, this would be a contrast between the reader's Swaraj and Gandhi's Swaraj. Because again, to the reader's Swaraj, uh, you know, action is pedagogical, right? Which is not action together, right? 
Uh, and it is very striking, for example, you know, and I think uh, that, that Gandhi insists that Gandhi, despite his hostility to the leader Swaraj, also acknowledges and participates in leading the Congress. Right? He says, this is not the Swaraj I want, right? But since that, if that's what you want, I'm going to work for it. Right? You know, and there is a certain sense in which you can think a certain notion of action right there, right? That you are acting with others whom you don't agree with at all, whom you spent your life attacking. You see, I mean, so there is a very interesting, I mean, articulation of action because action, as you know, in, in a Rent's definition, is precisely suspending your will. Yeah. So, and putting it, you know, in 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 a freedom. But only, I suppose, the difference from the, in the, in the argument, in the way I'm reading freedom here is that I'm stressing that there is also a liberal tradition of willing freedom, which perhaps Erin does not stress enough. You know, so. Yeah. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Um, if I think about uh, Gandhi's a very good subject, you know, he wrote in two different ways, one mm -hmm. in English, mm -hmm. for the English audience, other one is uh, the Gujarati audience, right? Uh, Dr. Ambedkar very clearly says, uh, as his double standard, you know, mm -hmm. right? So a person in the caste hierarchy of the, you know, caste embedded Hinduism, mm -hmm. he comes under Baniya, uh -huh. and, you know? So he's basically on the kind of upper level, you know, like a- Yes, a yes, Savarnath, absolutely. You know, like a, huh. Right? So with that in view, he talks about moksha, religion, and the spirituality of doing the scavenging. Yes. You know? And also he, Kind of he individually does that, you know, individually he's yes. cleaning his own toilet and things yes, like that. Yes, but yes, right. for the collective, he yes. still wanted that caste hierarchy. Yes, yes, against, you know? at, least so in the, at least in the early years. Huh? Yeah, huh. this contradiction is always there. So mm -hmm. basically he was uh, kind of a wanted of the status quo or the continuation of just throw out the British Raj and have the continuation. So don't you think that he made the foundation for today's, uh, you know, Actually, Congress was a soft uh, Hindutva. Now, uh -huh. what do you say? Hard Hindutva. There's uh -huh. the only difference, right? I mean, I would a, agree. I mean, so I, I, as I mean, far as the Congress goes, I would completely so before agree. Before 1947, there, yes, don't we think that he made the foundation for today's uh, times? That is a difficult. I mean, I would say that I would not. I definitely don't, would not want to say that he's innocent, right? Uh, but I think the, the relationship between his times and ours is more complicated. Uh, but let me just begin, let me step back a, for, uh, a, a moment, right? And I think let's take this word Harijan. Let's take this word Harijan, yeah. Yeah. right? Because, you know, I think this word Harijan is again very symptomatic hmm, of, yeah, you know, it's very symptomatic of some of the tensions at Mahagand. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, a forum in the, in the, in the recent, in a recent issue of Contemporary South Asia, which is where there are some essays about uh, unconditional equality and where I respond. And one of the arguments I make there about the term Harijan is that this term is interesting precisely because of the way it backs away from, you know, the kind of politics that Gandhi is involved in, right? So that it's, there's a sense in which Gandhi often betrays his own politics. Hmm? And that's one of the things that, I, that, uh, that is very central to, to my argument in the book. That, I, that what I insist is that one needs to distinguish between the politics that Gandhi makes possible hmm, and often the politics that Gandhi practices. Right? And here, I think the words, the, the, to, uh, so two points would be very relevant. One would be his own attitude to Satyagraha by Dalits. Satyagraha by Dalits. Right? You know, he insists, for example, that the English cannot give Indian Swaraj. We must take it ourselves, right? Uh, if he were to extend this logic, he should insist also that Dalits should fight for their own logic, should have Satyagraha against Apakas, right? Uh, but when it comes to that, you know, he says, no, no, Apakas must, right? Uh, you know, you don't agree? I think there is a sense if you. Yeah, but I mean, okay, I would agree that uh, it's more complicated, but there is a sense in which he's arguing very much that, you know, when, when for example, there is, a, there is a moment in which he's saying that, you know, that uh, the, when, when there's the idea of Dalits offering Satyagraha, he says that, look, we have to offer Prayaschit, right? But they're two different things. They're two different things, but. Someone has to offer Satyagraha, but then upper class can only offer Prayaschit. Yes, that is true. 
the upper caste can only offer price change. But at the same time, I, I would say that he's not very enthusiastic about that is practicing Satyagraha, right? Uh, so there is that kind of tension there. Hmm? Uh, again, if you take this word Harijan, right? Uh, the word Harijan is problematic precisely because what is being apotheosized here is a certain upper caste imagination of price chit. Right? Again, you know, he's effectively going against many of the things that he argues about. Hmm? So I would say that these are some of the many ways in which Gandhi is profoundly unable to live up to some of the openings that his own writing provides. Right? But I suspect that this is true of most interesting thinkers. You know? That is to say, most interesting thinkers are thinkers who, cannot, who are marked by these tensions. Right? I mean, those of us who are simpler thinkers merely are wrong. Right? <laughs> you know, we are simple, you know, or we just get, we take simpler positions. Right? But this is really, I mean, this is why we can, this is what makes a book a classic. Right? That you go and say that, look, uh, Kant was totally wrong about this, or you know, somebody, somebody was totally wrong about this, but this is why you go back, because there is a certain sense in which the text is open enough to allow for that. You know, so that's the way in which I would read Gandhi. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. No, you don't. No, I think what is interesting. No, I mean, uh, no, it can become, that is exactly where th this kind of danger is there, of imposing is sometimes there. But, you know, otherwise, I think there are lots of interesting questions also that he ra raises, you know. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Doug Kelbo. I'm from Calvin College, where I teach and write about architecture and uh, urban design, urban planning. I am not in the least a South Asian scholar. In fact, I'm barely a scholar. Um, but I have been to India, actually, as early as 52 years ago. Yes, you were telling me. And uh, been back several times, many times. Um, and by the way, I've been to the uh, Gandhi Center in um, Ahmedabad, which I would like to point out was designed by Charles Correa, our most famous graduate. <laughs> Um, whose daughter and grandchildren went to U of M as well. Anyway, uh, in terms of religion, I'm a, this may be wide of the mark completely. I don't know any of these Sanskrit terms. Um, but I'm wondering how Buddhism fits in, because after all, it started in India, mm -hmm. not actually far from Varanasi or Benares. Uh, and um, it seems simple to Gandhi's teachings in many ways, mm -hmm. but it's very clear that although it's practiced as a religion in parts of the world, it's actually not a religion, there's no deity, it's a philosophy, it's a way of life. 
Uh, and there's a certain amount of maybe giving up sovereignty, but not much, not to an omniscient, all-powerful not being all. like the three monotheistic religions that demand that for salvation, whatever. So it's really more of a, of a way of life that you don't give up all your sovereignty, freedom, and so on. You actually, uh, it's up to you how you behave and what kind of karma you create and what sort of afterlife or reincarnated life mm -hmm. you might have, whatever. It's not, it doesn't fit a lot of these criteria that you've been listing. And yet you say even atheists or religions, you know, anything that explains the or incalculable, incalculable huh. is a religion. So anyway, I just, what is the connection, do you think, to Buddhism? Between Buddhism and... Uh, Gandhi and... and your theory, your your right, thesis, right? Well, you know, it's it's, it's it's interesting you ask this question because, in a way, the new project I'm beginning uh, is exactly on Buddhism and uh, Ambedkar, you know, who is uh, the uh, figure who uh, is a Dalit leader, also uh, writes, you know, the Indian Constitution is uh, is also perhaps one of the most prominent figures in Indian politics hmm, in the mid 20th century. Hmm. Uh, in fact, I would say he, I would call him as a person who has the most effective critique of Gandhi. Uh, it's a critique that Gandhi himself is never able to, to, uh, to deal with. Right? And in fact, I do not think one can think Gandhi without dealing also with the questions that Ambedkar is asking. And Ambedkar in 1956 converts to Buddhism, right? which is also the beginning of Buddhism as uh, a modern religion in India. And uh, uh, what is fascinating about Ambedkar's reworking of Buddhism is that Ambedkar is actually taking something that is somewhat, you know, in, that is a religion that is very different from Gandhi's, but at the same time uh, emphasizing this combination of sovereignty and non-sovereignty, right? And one of the things, to go back to Gandhi for now, is that perhaps more than... Uh, more than Ambedkar, Gandhi emphasizes non-sovereignty, hmm? uh, whereas Ambedkar's focus is more on a relationship between sovereignty and freedom, hmm? which is at the same time marked by a non-sovereignty. Hmm? So there's, it's, it's, it's really a matter of often a difference in emphasis and a difference. So the, 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 the moment when, they, when Ambedkar turns to when, when Ambedkar comes in 1956 to Buddhism is fascinating for the way he articulates the whole concept of of Buddhism. So I would say that it's very interesting also that you know, if you think of the critics of Gandhi in the early 20th century, many of them are radical Buddhists. There is a tradition of radical Buddhism, and in a in a way. It is easier, perhaps, to trace a critique of caste. It is de not perhaps; it is definitely easier, right, to 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 undertake a critique of caste by beginning from Buddhism, than it is by beginning from Hinduism or from what what from the Hinduism that Gandhi inherits. Right? Uh, but what is also perhaps ma uh, marked about Gandhi's politics is that Gandhi insists, and I think this is a very interesting insistence on an inheritance, right? So an inheritance is also that which you inhabit and you rework, yeah? So in a sense, I think Gandhi's relationship with Hinduism is often that of an inheritance, which he must in some senses rework, right? And as he does that, there are, uh, th this is where he comes to the term Harijan. This is where in some senses the term Harijan also come, becomes, is decomposed, etc. So I'd say that, uh, there are very, there are, I would say that Buddhism is as open to this understanding of religion, though it would perhaps, at least in Ambedkar's case, it would be inflected very differently. So, so I want to take my, the, the chair's prerogative and ask a question, yes. um, reflecting back on uh, the, the, the nature of this conference as graduate student work, and ask you, you know, just as a scholar, mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> to reflect a bit on reading Gandhi in translation and then reading the Gujarati, um, particularly in with regards to not thinking of 
what Gandhi said, but thinking uh -huh. with Gandhi. Uh -huh. Can you talk about that? Sure. No, that is actually absolutely crucial. And I think uh, one of the things that I, I, I would really stress to begin with is uh, the question of translation, right? I mean, because one of the things that Gandhi does is he does these translations which are kind of bizarre, yeah? You know, I mean, he constantly translates religion as dharma, dharma as religion without ever bothering about it, right? Uh, and there are, this is just one of the many translations. Hmm? Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is also then again, Swaraj, freedom, sometimes there are words that he leaves untranslated. So the question is, uh, what is going on in this translation or non-translation? Hmm? And I think perhaps one way of thinking of it is that the untranslatable is perhaps itself one way of understanding uh, willing and non-willing, right? The untranslatable, I might say, is both is, is not one but two in form, sovereign and non-sovereign, right? And we often operate with a non with a sovereign understanding of the untranslatable. So let's say, for example, when I say that. How can you translate dharma into religion? Because dharma is part of this complex, this Indian complex, and religion is part of this Western complex. All right? Then I'm operating effectively with a notion of a cultural complex. Right? And something becomes untranslatable across a cultural complex. And something is translatable only within a cultural complex. Right? And that notion of thinking of translation is what I would call a sovereign untranslatability, you know, which is something I've argued about elsewhere. And uh, you know, where sovereign untranslatability prevails, then Gandhi's translations appear irresponsible. But there is also another way of thinking the untranslatable, uh, which is that the untranslatable is nothing but non-willing itself, right? That you know, when one is translating without a certain kind of justification that one can provide, you know, there is a certain kind of uh, movement that is taking place which cannot be described in terms of, you know, the, the usual trajectories that we use to justify. It's perhaps, again, if you want to use another kind of uh, analogy, you might say that uh, here you have a performative transformation, right, as opposed to a constitutive translation, right? Again, and the performative is about felicity, right? And felicity is uh, so crucial that you cannot predict it in advance. So I would say that one of the biggest challenges for me has been how to uh, be faithful to this, to this, to translating Gandhi, right? How to translate Gandhi and how to responsibly, you know, move between these translations and how to responsibly read Gandhi's translation, sometimes retranslate him. And I would say that uh, perhaps uh, one of the things that's uh, happened in the process is that I have had to <laughs> think much more carefully about vocabulary <laughs> than I would have had before. You know, and words have suddenly become much more opaque to me you know, than they were at the beginning of my research project. When I, I'll confess that when I started the Gandhi project in 2002, I thought I would be done in three years. <laughs> And the book is just out. <laughs> so, yeah. So is that broadly? Yeah, I think that's, huh? I think we all deal with that problem. Yes. So. Any other questions? Do you, do you like Gujarati? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a Malayali, uh, but I grew up partially in Gujarat. So you know Gujarati? I had to learn Gujarati. Uh, I mean, in the sense, I, I was a journalist, so I knew some Gujarati. But then, for this project, I try to improve my Gujarati. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, uh, uh -huh. Well, there is certainly, I mean, I would definitely say that, you know, the, the, the extirpation of Buddhism occurs very much as far as we know. But it's not a period that I'm an expert on. If somebody's an expert on this, I should, I would cede uh, ground to them. But as far as I know, the extirpation of Buddhism records is definitely part of a caste, uh, you know, of a caste, uh, caste mobilization. But there is also the, one of the interesting things that happens from the 12th century onwards is the rise of the bhakti tradition. The bhakti tradition. Yeah? And the bhakti tradition is always very, very complex to deal with. On the one hand, the argument could be made that the bhakti uh, followers accepted caste. 
On the other hand, it's also true that the bhakti followers were amongst the most radical critics of caste. You know. But I would definitely agree that until the modern period, uh, there is no systematic critique of caste of the kind that is laid out by the early 20th century, by the late 19th century, early 20th century with Pule and others. You know. So that's when caste comes again to the fore as a new formation. Right? Uh, but let's also not forget that the power of caste increases a lot in the, from the 18th century, hmm? partially because there is this kind of new sovereignty that the British bring, hmm? which makes caste formations much, much more powerful than they were able to be. Say, for example, if you think of, uh, of the region that I studied for my first book, hmm? one of the interesting things about that region is that it's so sparsely populated that there are often lower castes moving to that region, partially as a way of getting away from the upper caste. Right? And in some senses, this mobility, you know, if you, if you remember that uh, till around uh, the mid 19th century, close to half of India is forested or you know, not cultivated, right? there is a kind of pos potential for mobility that prevents or at least limits in many areas, not in all areas. For example, Kerala, it's, it's not like that at all. But in many areas, limits the kind of violence that upper caste can have. And it, this violence, therefore, becomes much more acute with the consolidation of, of with, 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 the, with, the, with the spread of agriculture, with the consolidation of settled societies. You know. So that is perhaps one thing that I add. But again, this is not a period that I work on. So if anybody wants to, you know, this is, I'm basically, <laughs> add to add to this, I'd be quick to back off. Thank you so much. <laughs>